Well, I think where you should move, um, you know, if we look back at the Hyogo One framework and in the, line, in the light of the um, Millennium Development Goals and the emerging discussion on climate change adaptation, which was very young at that time, then there is no, no direct relationship made, nothing established. But it was a time when the discussion on risk as a dimension of of what we call skewed development, but probably of development as such in the way it was expressed, you know, was becoming very obvious. And so with the next one, I think the fundamental thing is to, that it is laid out as, both from the HFA2 perspective, but also from the SDGs perspective and the climate change caucus, that risk is fundamentally a development problem and a problem for development. Well, you know, if I look at it from the, you know, the perspective of risk in the framework of development challenges today, I think we have to be very pragmatic without being um, condescending in the topic. And that is to accept that levels of risk will exist. There is a, this has come from what I've understood of development. So I remember way back in the 60s, the debate amongst environmentalists in Britain it was the imminent of the statement by the Minister of Industry of India who said, send us all the contaminating industry you want. I'm more interested in creating employment. And that, that sort of contradiction will come up over and over again. So I think there's a level of risk we're gonna to have to accept. Sure. And what is in play is how we can guarantee a playoff, playing that off against increased living standards, um, accumulated resilience, if we like to use those words, etc. So, yeah, I don't think the risk formula is going to dominate over the need for employment and economic growth, but I think, you know, very definitely we have to be very conscious of this and to be on top of it in the most philosophically pragmatic fashion, and I'm not sure how we can construct that, but I, I've come to the conclusion that, well, the climate change adaptation one is one we can build on and build into because it does have more political saliency. Um, it is a more permanent problem. I remember listening to a, why was climate change so rapidly taken on the political agenda and in news terms it is because it is current, current affairs whereas disasters are something that come and go and is in the press, etc. So, yeah, I'm not sure how to formulate that but, um, but um, along that line there's something. Well, I, yeah, my basic feeling, and I've written a couple of things for the Colombian government and for the Peruvian governments who are looking to integrate their frameworks between climate change adaptation and disaster risk. But, you know, the essential element which brings the, all of these things together is the notion of risk and of challenges to development or of development impacts, etc. So, you know, the only way of getting out of the the disjuncture, if that word exists, and there's probably a lot of Spanish words coming out here, um, between the two is to come in through the back door, that is to get out of the environmental caucus with climate change adaptation and ministries of environment and get out of the response framework and civil defense thing, which still dominates uh, with disaster risk reduction and come in through the back door of development. And it will be development that will allow you to bring them together and when what is it what is essentially in play is risk with both of them now that risk can be expressed as, a, as um, exceptional risk if we like to call disaster risk exceptional risk it can be through our everyday risk or quotidian risk um, but the, the interesting thing to me is that for the first time you know, when we look at disaster risk um, problems the averages of temperature or the averages of environment have never been a problem. They have what determine what you do where. So agriculture is determined by the averages of climate, um, et cetera, et cetera. But with climate change, changing averages then become a risk. They become a new stressor. And you could, in fact, have conditions that have been depicted as disaster in the past according to aridity or desertification or, or hunger coming out of changing averages, but not to do with changing extremes. You know, the extremes to me and the other um, damaging events which associate are part of a continuing disaster risk management problem. I don't see how anybody can even deny that. I don't understand why 
you could talk about adaptation to extremes. As I say, you adapt to changing ongoing norms and, 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 and averages. So, you know, it, it, it strikes me that the problem here is a conceptual one, but it is also one of what we call path dependencies and the creation of structures which now impede us getting to that integration that should have been there from the beginning. And what is interesting is to ask historically why these things get divided up the way they get divided up. No? Yeah. Well, personally, resilience to me is not a term that attracts me. I find it confuses more than clarifies. Um, and that's mainly because I don't believe there is anything implicit in the multiple definitions of it that cannot be expressed through other concepts, terms, and ideas which we've developed over the years. And it strikes me that we're getting into the same, I remember with the IPCC ex, um, extreme event study in the first chapter, we were asked to look at coping as being a strategy for almost adaptation. And of course, coping, which comes from way back, has in the same way as resilience is being, being interpreted um, according to the whims of those, you know, in, in the nicest sort of way, the whims of those that want to interpret it. So I have a fundamental objection with, um, with ideas, definitions, concepts, or words that you can basically interpret them as you wish, and you can change their original meaning to fit you. And the question comes when you have to change the word you're using to describe this instead of making resilience be anything from before, during, and after, to being something with a response to the impact, to being something, or, or resilience to risk as opposed to resilience to disaster. I'm not a great fan of resilience, to be quite honest. It confuses me far more than it, um, you know, and vulnerability is confused at times because of the varying uses, but nothing like resilience, which, and, and I, I get a feeling here that, you know, there is very little consider that, you know, I consider that I always, I'm always thinking conceptually and one has spent a lot of time trying to um, get to conceptual thought on this. So I'm probably over, overboard on that. Um, but I think in general, we don't think that much about, um, about the, the notions we're using actually. They become very flippantly used in the nicest sense of the word by, by a lot of people, you know, including oneself at times. And I'm working with the notion of disaster risk governance now, but I don't think people have thought too much about the substance of that as opposed to the ephemeral nature of it expressed through laws or policies or whatever. But when you get down to the deep nitty gritty of it, I'm not sure how much we've, we've worked on it. Um, uh, and certainly we haven't worked sufficiently, I don't think. Very interesting. Well, the conceptual link is, again, like um, what, I, what I've been trying to express about mainstream. I don't believe that you can link one thing to another where that one thing is part of the other. So the whole definition of sustainability as does is development to me is defined by, uh, I cannot imagine of development increasing the chances of you dying or losing your livelihood or your, your property. So, you know, security is an implicit part of development and security is an implicit part, explicit part of, um, of sustainability. And therefore, risk is the antithesis of security when it is actually actualized in loss and so it just strikes to me that one of the indicators of sustainability and the indicators of, of development is, in fact, secure societies, which means societies in which risk is managed adequately, not, not, not got rid of completely as is impossible, etc. So I don't see, yeah, and this is a philosophical and sort of um, principle of whether you're linking mainstreaming or whether you're redefining or defining sustainability and development in those terms. Well, GAR, what is going to be structured as now is, is not a thematic um, topic like the previous ones were poverty, um, um, government, and private sector. And, um, and this debate we're having here is part of this process of a retrospective, but a retrospective which is not done just because of a retrospective analysis that will inform the future of this topic. And so there's a lot of debates involved in that. Um, yeah, at present, there's this process of different organizations have agreed to um, 
coordinate the production of a document which looks at the state of risk analysis, what has been achieved, where are we, of risk governance, of early warning, etc. And these will be fed into the global assessment report. That is now a decision. Um, yeah, w when I look at the whole, the whole structure of these things, I, I, I have a particular predisposition towards typologies. You know, and that may be because I'm a geographer and we look at regions and uh, typologies are forms of regions. It's regionalizing knowledge domains, etc. And so, yeah, when I look at Hyoga 1, for instance, and structured, of course, to themes which typify the disaster risk management process, but don't typify risk. And so, you know, each of those five have to be referred to some particular risk context. So I would like to see GAR at some time, and maybe we can bring this in, discussing a typology of risk conditions in the world, which will imply that we have more research on the ongoing risk construction processes within that typology. And to put an example of it, um, for instance, you know, large metropolitan areas is a risk context. Right which despite the fact that Bombay and Calcutta may be very different to Sao Paulo and to Mexico City, there are generic factors which are contributing to risk in multi-hazard contexts in common. And if we take lowland commercial agriculture in the Guatemala coast or the Mexican coast or I imagine in India where we have migrant labor, um, um, labor um, um, salaried labor, that is a very different risk type or risk context to uplands in T Tibet or in Nepal or in Guatemala or Bolivia where we have um, poor, impoverished, um, indigenous, multi-ethnic um, communities living um, in, 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 in fragile environments. And that's another risk context. And so the five pillars as they are now, to me, should feed into that typology of risk. So, and in a more holistic fashion, because this breakdown of the pillars destroys the notion of collectivity. So pillar two is in fact the basis of getting risk governance off the ground. If we cannot convince through risk analysis that this is an important problem, we can't expect policy and legal reforms and institutional reforms and in the same way as that feeds into the early warning and then the and so on. So that's, um, it's not about gas so much as about the structure of thought around, um, around the Hyogo framework. And what Hyogo should be doing through the ISDR and the international system is open to debate. But I think, you know, a lot of the things of what um, Marco was mentioning about synergy, um, networking, bringing together, is, is, uh, strikes me as it, it, it rings a note uh, in some way without having thought through it completely as the debate goes on. Now, I, I, my only thought is that you know, as we've come through the years and we've been convinced we've been walking the right path, and I think we have, I think there are, there are paths that have to be taken that aren't necessarily in retrospect the paths that maybe we should have taken, but that's the nature of change. But I think, you know, in the future, this it does require a considerable break with thought patterns of the past, and that means reforming institutions, reforming governance principles, etc. Um, how to do that, I'm not sure, but I don't think the repetition of status quo and the whole thing of path dependencies, unless we are very radical, without you know, radical in the sense of, of significant change. Um, and that means pushing this, uh, yeah, I've mentioned a couple of times, that it means unemploying ourselves as disaster risk specialists. You know, I can see completely on disaster response, but that is a very, very specialized area of concern with the need for, but in this area, beyond the corrective risk management stuff with you know, correcting existing risk context, retrofitting hospitals. The other one is a development problem. And, it's, um, and if, unless the development actors are in there, yeah, we, they will, we, can't, we can't nag at them about doing things. They have to nag themselves about the need to do it.